in the back. It's all fine. Great. Uh, welcome to this uh, well, just afternoon session, the first one. Uh, my name is John Lindberg. I head up the healthcare program at Intellect. Uh, we are the UK technology trade body, representing some 800 companies who do your super fast broadband, your 4G for your phones, your online banking solutions, your everything you use technology for. But we also represent a lot of companies who work in the healthcare uh, sector who help want to deliver this joined up uh, health and social care through technology. Um, and the reason we are here and I'm here today is that our job is to help uh, the industry understand what we can do and what we need to learn from the carers, from the patients and the manager of what we need to do from a technology perspective to join up health and care. Um, so I'm quite delighted to be here and, and facilitate this uh, session because all these guys on the table will be telling us how we need to do it. Uh, so I'll be listening, but I'll also be hopefully posing some challenging questions to them. Um, and uh, we have Lord Victor, who's the chief exec of uh, Turning Point. Uh, we have Lloyd Baker from the Central Eastern CSU. Uh, we have Stuart Campbell from Hertfordshire County Council. And we have Charles O'Hanlon from the Newham CCG. I hope I got that all correct. Uh, and they'll be going in that order. They'll give a five-minute overview from their perspective of joining up health and care uh, uh, through technology centered around patients. So we'll give them all five minutes each. Hopefully, we'll have some time for a debate and questions from the floor. So that's it from me. So, uh, Lord Victor, do you want to start? Okay. Please. can't hear me, so that's a problem. Is that better? Okay, good. Uh, we're all together. So, since I'm amongst friends, you can all call me um, Lord Victor Adiboali, CB, and I'm only joking. Victor will do nicely. Um, I um, have several hats, actually, that I wear, and they all kind of come together around this issue. Um, and let me explain what some of those hats are. I'm the Chief Executive of Turning Point Health and Social Care. We provide services to, I don't know, a few hundred thousand people covering mental health, learning disabilities, substance misuse, primary care and employment. Um, we employ just under 3,000 people and we operate in 200 locations in England and Wales. I'm also a board member of NHS England and I'm on the board of a small technology company called THP Innovation and what THP Innovation does, it provides, I call it Skype for adults, but basically it, provide, it provides um, safe uh, technologies for video conferencing and sharing of images and all that sort of stuff. And, and with those hats on, I have a kind of non-IT expert's view of what some of this might be about. And I'm really glad that we started off with the most important um, word in all this, which is patient or person, people. And so what I have to say to you is much more about people than it is to do with, with the technology. And if, and if that's okay, that's, I'll, I'll continue. I mean, I've got no ego involved in this, so if people get up and walk out, it's fine with me. I'm pretty cool about it. So what I can say, the following things are, are, are true, um, and you all know this, but um, technology has the ability to, to join up processes, um, uh, but it needs to, it, clinicians can lead and drive Technological, technological change, and one of the things that we have learned, at least I hope we've learned, is that the application of technology without the understanding of the human is pretty useless, and, and we've learned that painfully, and it's cost us billions um, to learn it. We know um, that the patient should be at the starting point, and we know that the NHS needs um, more innovation, um, or needs to be innovation friendly, although I'm less concerned about the word innovation than I am about um, uh, uh, about the word risk, actually, because I think there's loads of innovation. What stops innovation is risk aversion, right, as opposed to risk awareness. So I'm kind of a bit bored with the word innovation because there's lots of it going around. What, what there isn't is the right context in which we can take it up, test it, and, and improve it. I think the current issues for um, technology are as much about how we commission services um, genuinely commissioned services as they are about the technology itself. And what I mean by that is that um, much of what goes on, in my view, has little to do with truly understanding the needs of individuals and or communities, such that we can build a platform for procurement. Right? And, um, in the in, and what, I mean, what I mean by that is that uh, when Turning Point works in communities, which we do a lot, 
One of the things that we have developed is a methodology which engages communities in understanding what they've got, what they haven't got, what they need and how they need it. And we can get people to design and deliver services. Because actually, most interventions in health and social care do not require a medic. What then needs to happen, and what doesn't happen often enough, is the infrastructure around that that would help empower people to co-produce either exists in small packets of technology, you know, electronic patient records, and which is unknown to, to, the, to these people and to these methods of patient engagement, or is so far away from the process of commissioning that I've just described that it's dropped in and isn't used. Do you, am I, am I, are you still with me? So, I've, the, the end, last 30 seconds, I would say the critical challenge for technology in health and social care is to understand how commissioning can be defined as truly meaning understanding the needs of individuals and or communities such that you can build a platform for procurement, right, in which technology can provide an appropriate infrastructure at the commissioning stage. That's the challenge. Because if you can if you can meet that challenge, it's the people probably who aren't in this room which will be demanding your services as opposed to you trying to push your services into the people. End of. Thank you. I hope that made sense. It made perfect sense to me. But I think it d does. And Sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll hold our applause to, for everybody afterwards. Uh, and I think you will hear now from some of the, the, the other panelists, actually, it's some the ways they've come around and actually made some of that work. So, Lloyd, do you want to tell us what you've done uh, around uh, integrating uh, care for, for children and information? On that yeah, so place? I'm Lloyd Baker, part of um, Central East and CSU. And through strong relationships with our CCGs and now their um, specialist bodies, we, um, we've had a long-standing relationship about how we're going to do an integration piece about um, care across the entire care pathway. And to begin that journey, we thought, We'd, we'll take it in small chunks, we'll, we'll bite off what we can chew, and in essence we, we looked at a very discreet piece of work about vulnerable children in our community. Um, as is the case for lots of organisations in the east of England, we've got a very prevalent System 1 user population across community and child health, and by default System 1 does address some of those challenges around shared care, but um, what we needed to do was understand how we could get some of that key crucial data about children at risk out of system one and made available to um, a small group of child protection specialists and professionals that are interested in seeing it that didn't have access to that system. So we, we looked at technologies available and came to the conclusion that clinical portals was probably the, a, a sensible way forward. So in the interest of keeping it small and simple, we went for a proof of concept model which took an extract of data from System 1, um, placed it into a portal piece of technology, and then through managing legitimate relationships, those GPs who had patients who were deemed at-risk at children, there was a flag within System 1 that the clinician ticks, could go and look at that information freely. Um, and it was predominantly around decision support and helping that agenda, but we had the right level of professional engagement and clinical buy-in, so it was a very achievable piece of work in that small scale. The overall vision is that once we've achieved that piece of work and delivered it successfully is to try and then look at wider engagement and our CCGs are very committed to bringing in acute mental health and community services across the patch. Um, so taking out what, what we've done in, in that small piece of work, there's been many challenges as you can guess, um, governance, access, uh, culture being a key one, it's, it's trying to move clinicians and, and service users away from I want all that information in my system and saying well actually you probably want one version of that truth so why don't you just have a live access to it um, and that's quite a hard battle to, to win but what we think we're doing in Hertfordshire is, is the building blocks for wider partnership engagement and that is if we get this piece right we've built an infrastructure and a support network that says we can scale that and ultimately we, we're already working with our partners um, across uh, different providers and social services police 
and probation. And it probably leads now on to what Stuart could offer the group regarding the work with social services. One second. Let's, let's, let's hear this one. Okay, pe people hear me now. Thank, thanks, Lloyd. Yeah, Stuart Campbell um, representing Hertfordshire County Council in terms of the social care side of things. And uh, where, where um, Lloyd has just spoken, um, spoken about what, he, what he's done internally within the uh, health service, um, I'm going to look at this from uh, the inter-organisational relationship issues. Um, I want to start off by saying, really, I think, you know, the, the issues but the, 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 around this whole area are really not about the technology. I think that's already been said. Uh, the, the technology has to be done. Uh, the key challenges to us are behavioural and cultural, and particularly between organisations, that becomes very, very difficult. I've been working with Lloyd and his colleagues to, to try and cut through some of that. And just a, a few insights into, into what some of those main challenges have been for us, really. I think the ability to actually share data and information securely between uh, and safely between us is key, and we're not good at doing that. I think the whole uh, media view that, that, that there are bureaucrats out there who, who just want your data and won't treat it safely is, is, is really winning the day in terms of some of the noises that are out there in the press. And what we need to be able to do is actually win back that trust in terms of being able to um, manage people's data effectively for benefits for the, uh, for the citizen, the patient um, moving forward. Um, the, the reaction to that can be inflexible data, data exchange practices, and I think there is some of that going on. We need to cut through that. Secondly, in my experience in terms of working across organisations, is that um, it, it's, it's difficult getting senior level agreement to proceed on such projects and programmes. Uh, we, we, in Hertfordshire, for example, you can't go to one or even two people to try and get that sort of decision. You need to find the right people, you need to get them into the right governance structures, and that is a long haul. So uh, we need to get much better, I think, at um, ensuring that we've got those relationships in place moving forward so that these sorts of projects can move forward effectively. And, and the final thing I want to say before handing over to Charles really is that um, we need to take a grown-up approach to benefits between our organisations. Some of the things that we might do in social care around these types of programmes will actually lead to financial benefits on behalf of the NHS and vice versa. Um, but we need to be working in partnership so that in the round, the person who benefits is the citizen and patient. I think that's where you come in, Charles. Um, okay, hello everyone. Um, although I work for the NHS, I'm actually a patient. I'm here as a patient. Um, to explain my background, I've, I've had cancer twice in my life, twice, um, although a relatively young man. Um, what I want to talk about is, because I've had such a long journey with it, I've, had a system, I've been in systems that are integrated and also systems that are really not integrated. And when it's not integrated, things like tests are repeated, providers can't access the data. Um, it's really frustrating. It really disempowers you as a patient. Um, to me, we use a people, we use clinical nurse specialists and, and clinicians to, to integrate the system, but actually technology is probably the key to actually getting it right and making them, their job easier. Um, as a patient, I think that um, what's really frustrating is often the information's out of date. So you go to speak to, uh, to a doctor or a nurse and, and actually the information they have is not correct. And that really undermines your confidence as a patient in what they have to say. And actually the job as technology specialists in the health service is actually to, to make that better for me as a patient, to make sure that they get the right information and that's what you, we really need to achieve for us. Um, but also it's about uh, empowering our families. Um, you know, no one has these journeys, these long-term conditions on their own. They have them with a raft of other people there to support them. And actually, systems that allow their family to access the data as well as the patient allow people to be properly supported. And that's really, really important. Um, I think actually the other thing is, you know, I'm IT literate and I'd like to access my own data. And actually being told that you have to make a, a, freedom of, a data protection uh, act request, um, that's not really good enough. Uh, you want to know actually, you want to know instantly what's actually happened. And actually what I want to see is that actually systems are, allow us as patients uh, to, go on to, to go on to the actual system and see what, what, what's actually been done to us and not being told that you're going to have to wait 20 days uh, before you actually see what happened to you. Um, I think the final thing, what, what, what we don't want as patients, we're also all taxpayers, or, or, and we, want, we, we, we don't want another system, another a big IT system that's going to be put in. And that's why the clinical portal model really kind of 
for, as a manager, let's say, appeals to me, and as a taxpayer, and actually as a patient, because it's not another high-risk implementation. It's something that brings things together. Um, so I'm really pleased the colleagues are trialing it out, and I, I hope to, to see more about it as a patient. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Victor, what do you feel after hearing all of that? Do you think some of your concerns and challenges can be sort of solved through the work they've been doing? Well, it would appear that we're in violent agreement, which is a good thing, because um, uh, they're big lads. Um, I, I guess there's a couple of things. One, uh, the, la um, the last contribution from the patient is, and, and I'm sorry, I missed your name, and I'm very sorry, John. Um, we're both from Newham. We both know Newham really well, and so there's no excuse, is, is the critical issue here. And um, Tim Kelsey, some of you will, will know, have heard of, uh, shares the same passion that I have, which is that we need to remove the barriers to accessing information, and we need to start talking less, in my view, less about data, which Tim does talk about, and data transparency, uh, and more about information access and information transparency. I think that um, we need to do that with an eye to the fact that 8 million people don't use or have access to the internet, and some of those people are the people at the sharp end of the inverse care law. Um, the, that law that states that those people who need of health and social care the most tend to get it the least. But with that in mind, it is all doable. The technology is available. The, the critical issue is how we shape the argument around the patient. That's the, that's the thing we need to focus on. Thank you. Um, any thoughts from the, the panel on that? Probably just to pick up on the on the patient access agenda, um, it is a crucial part of our vision in Hertfordshire that whatever technology we put that underpins this um, integration piece does lead to um, easy access and transparent access for the patient to be able to look at their data. Um, and again, if you put in the building blocks around the right piece of technology with the correct buy-in, then in theory you should only have to invest in this once. Um, and, and start to address these, these different and common agendas. How do you, how do you overcome the, the risk aversion that Victor mentioned before, or even how do you identify the benefits and how you share those across? Because that's a big problem, not just for what you've said, but across the entire health and care system. People talking, well, we can't do that in part because we don't share the equal risk or the equal benefits. How have you sort of tackled that in in your organisations and with, well, working it, with Hertfordshire? It's part of what, um, I mean, our, our CCGs um, in particular are looking at um, complete pathway approach. They want to break down the boundaries of where typical care begins and ends. Um, so I know for a fact with, uh, we had a, a seminar session in the West Hertfordshire area last week where social services are, are a key stakeholder and integrated piece of looking at children and, their, and elderly care pathways. So um, it is about... As Stuart said, it, it, the effect of one negative or positive could drop into the camp of the other. But um, I think it's, it's, it's now with CCGs, their clinical leadership, that we can move that agenda forward slightly better than we could. And how do we get the patients involved from the beginning of this so they can actually be involved in determining what the services should look like and use the technology? But that, that, that again, so, I, I mean, I, I can speak quite freely on behalf of Hertfordshire, but, but the, um, each, each CCG and their, and their strategic programme group have got both patient um, stakeholder groups and uh, expert working groups, so that they really are addressing the challenge of bringing patients into this. Now, what, what I do is make sure that there is a, a solution or a technology set uh, or a platform that, that then allows them to deliver. So my approach is very light touch. I'm not, I don't want to go in and, and introduce new systems, new processes, extended clinical contact times just because we want to achieve something. It's about, well, let's look at the, look at the clinical program first, then see what fits in underneath that. And it, and it comes through effective business change and, and managing, managing that impact. Charles? I think the other one might work. Working? Oh, yeah. it's working. Um, I, I just like to say that um, information governance is is often used as a as a thing, kind of maybe not to, as a reason not to make decisions. Um, and my real thing is, if you've got a long term condition and you're dealing with four different five to providers, the GP, 
a million other things. Actually, you want everyone to share information. You really don't are not worried about people about the health professionals looking after you sharing your information. We need to get that right and understand that and stop hiding behind information governance as a reason not to integrate. That's can I just say that's a really powerful point. I think some of information government is an artifact for risk aversion. And I think that the, cl the critical thing is that the patient has to be at the center of the service design. So, you know, the, fa the fact of the matter is that there are organizations that protect their power and budgets. And I've always found that the best um, uh, excuse remover is having the patient experience at the center of the room and the discussion, and then you say to them, if you can't contribute to improving the experience of this patient, what are you doing here? And you, it, it shifts the debate. It, it shifts. It shifts the, the. It shifts the debate from can, uh, you know, from and it moves the Mexicans, uh, Mexicans into the Mexican uh, bucket, and and that's critical. But it sounds easy, but it's a really challenging um, move to make for many of our. Um, statutory and non-statutory organisations because we're used to thinking in a certain way. Um, so I, I authorised, sorry I'll just say this now, sure. I authorised, I, I chaired the CCG authorisation subcommittee for NHS England, right? So the, what you're talking about in relation to what CCGs do with communities is part of something we call Domain 6 and I'll be honest with you, I think that it's one of the weakest areas of CCG operation. I, don't, I just don't think we have the right technologies, both IT and non-IT, to be really clear that what we do, what we are doing with communities, is of a credible standard. That's why I talked to you about connected care. There's some key tests that we just don't apply, and it's one of the weakest areas, in my view, of both CCG operation and CSE operation. Sorry. That's, no, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor? We have one down here. Rebecca. Hi, it's Rebecca Toff from eHealth Insider. Uh, you were talking there about not hiding behind IG. I was just wondering, uh, I was at a conference recently where some people were saying that they believe that um, the Health and Social Care Act and Caldecott 2 are actually going to make it harder to share data rather than easier. Can you talk a bit about that? I guess I think it, 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 um, the passion is there to share the data and actually um, I think there's been some recent um, kind of um, announcements actually which put an onus on the provider where actually the risk is of not sharing and that's where it needs to get to where actually the whole clinical governance agenda and framework places the onus on to share and if you have, make a decision not to share you have to have a very good justification. Um, I'm not too sure where um, where we are with that in terms of actually getting that, that that culture existing within the CCGs across nationally, but that's certainly where we need to go. And I think the the the, social, the, the act does support us to do some of that. But there, there does need to be an initial, rather than an initial during the transition, an initial push back on sharing data. The direction of travel clearly has to be and making sure that the governance framework puts the the emphasis on that sharing rather than the risk of sharing and the, the importance of sharing for, for professionals. One more question. Any here in the front? Hello, uh, Jeremy Nettle, uh, Oracle Corporation. Uh, I had the privilege of working uh, with NHS London on um, what we call CP24, which was uh, a project similar to yourselves, which was around uh, children at risk. And it was after the Baby P, or Baby Peter uh, challenges, about how you share information between uh, health and uh, social care. Uh, the point I wanted to raise uh, in that, and though the project it was a prototype, uh, was deemed to be successful. There were some interesting learning patterns in there. And it was actually that the parents of children who weren't at risk minded that we were looking to see if their children were at risk. So there's some interesting cultural shifts there. So what this system did is identified from um, local authority kids at risk and provided that information to the A&E department in real time uh, I was near the dam in real time. And then uh, if that child did appear, 
then they would let the caseworker know that the child had uh, come into the system. But what was interesting, as I say, it was the parents of children who, you know, why do you think I might, you know, why do you think my child was at risk? And it's those barriers to get over that if you're going to have this open system, how you put structure, it's not technology structures, it's about in, uh, informing people that we're going to do this. And the actual reaction of parents or or carers, that the loved one is going to be investigated in this way. Do we just agree? Or do you want to, anybody respond to it? <laughs> or do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Have we been called time? Um, yeah, so the, the initial work we've done in Hertfordshire is scoping out what it is we want to achieve in, in a very small scale. Um, as, as of yet, we are, we are yet to embark that outside of around four or five GP practices. But, but at the next stage, because we've, we've got a, a reasonably large group of professionals that are key interests across multi-agencies, then it is about the engagement piece with, with the patient directly that we then need to take forward. But um, yeah, that barrier amongst um, numerous others will be our, our, our challenge. All right. Right. Um, so what I recommend we do, if that's okay with everybody, is that we'll, I'll, I'll introduce Wayne uh, Postle from Harris to come and give his uh, presentation, and then that will leave us an additional 10 minutes or so at the end for further Q&A with the panel. So if everybody is fine with that, we'll uh, move straight into the presentation and then do more Q&A at the end. So 